Hello friends, welcome again to Grace Baptist Church here in Randleman, North Carolina. This is our Wednesday night service, this being August the 18th, and we hope you're having a great week this week, and I hope you're ready to study. Study the Word of God. It'll help you, and it'll give you strength. It'll give you assurance. It'll give you purpose. And it will definitely give you wisdom and guidance. Take your Bible and turn with me. We're in chapter 17 of Proverbs. And we're going to pick it up at verse 7 about where we left last week. And continue here in chapter 17. So let's go to the Lord in prayer right before our message. Father, as we study tonight, fill us with your Holy Spirit. Teach us things that will help us to be more like our Savior. Keep us away from the booby traps I'm sure that Satan would throw in our path. I pray you'll just help us to learn the wisdom we need from this passage to apply these principles, and we'll give you the praise for it. For it's in our Savior Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, verse number 7 says, Excellent speech becometh not a fool, much less do lying lips a prince. Now that's kind of very unusual verse. Think about this. Excellent speech becometh not a fool. Much less do lying lips a prince. Now it's a contradiction in terms for a fool to speak well or for a prince to be a liar. See, it's not becoming for such inappropriateness to exist. Think about that. A prince is supposed to tell the truth. And the foolish person normally is going to talk foolishly. The wise person, he's the one who's going to speak wise words. The wicked, vile person has a hard time using intelligent, superior language because they are usually saying something foolish and vile. And have you ever been around someone uh, who seemed to just curse and swear every other word and then maybe even take our wonderful Lord's name in vain? And they're not showing their intelligence there. They're showing ignorance. Many do it to try to appear mean and bad and in reality, everybody's probably thinking, you know what? <laughs> I've got to get away from this person. I don't want to hear this type of language. So choose your words very wisely and carefully because our words describe what's in our heart. Whatever's on the inside is going to come out. And so use good language. I remember hearing about a young man who got saved and he told his pastor, he said, uh, Pastor, I want you to pray for me. I'm a mechanic by trade, and we always have problems around the, uh, you know, the garage, and I'm just used to cursing, and I hope and pray God will give me deliverance and help me to use good, clean language instead of cursing. I want to be a good witness for the Lord. So the pastor said, well, I'll tell you what you do. Every time you feel like saying a cuss word, he said, just quote a scripture or sing a hymn. And it'll just naturally get better and better. So the young Christian, he was so excited. He got up early the next morning. He went to work. And about 10, 11 o'clock in the morning, the pastor was kind of wondering, I wonder how that young man's doing down at the garage. So he got in his car and drove down to the garage just to see how the young convert was doing. And as he pulled up, he saw that he was under a car working, but his feet were out the side, so he knew it was this young man who had been saved. And he said, son, but before he even said anything, he heard him singing. He was singing a song. So he said, son, how's everything going? And he rolled out from underneath the car. Preacher, it's so good to see you. Thank you for coming down here and checking on me. Everything's going fine. 
He said, well, I thought I heard you singing a hymn there. He said, oh, yes, I did. I feel like saying a cuss word, but I didn't do it. And he said, I'm doing real well. I said, I've quoted 10 scriptures and sang five hymns already. It's only been about two hours. But honest to goodness, we need to be very careful about the words that we say. Listen to Proverbs 4.23. Proverbs 4.23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Guard your heart, because what's on the inside of the heart is going to make what comes out on the outside in the life of that individual. If it's good thoughts, good things will happen. Listen to what Jesus said in Luke 6.45. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. But an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. So what's on the inside, as I said, is going to come up sooner or later. Like the well water. Put the bucket down in the water and brings the water up. If it's nice, pure and clean and sparkly, it's got some good well water in it. You want to drink that water. But if it comes back up and it's dirty and filthy and smelly, <laughs> you don't want to drink that water. You don't, you don't probably get poisoned by it somehow. And so that's kind of the way our words describe the inside of our heart. So that's why I think he's given us a, a warning here. Use good words. Use good words. But on the other hand, people do not expect their leaders to lie and be deceptive. The prince and the king was to be honest. That's what the verse is actually saying here. They were to be honest with their people. And they were to be honest in dealing with others and the family. And we need to be honest dealing with our family, our friends, our relatives, those that we work with places of employment, our church family. Always remember people have a tendency to judge others by the words they employ. So be very careful. <laughs> Little tongue what you say. James said no man can tame the tongue. Sometimes we say, boy, I think I'm doing pretty good and all of a sudden we slip up. Say something we shouldn't have said. Why did I say that? I should never have said that. And it happens. So we need the Lord's help. Pray every day. God help me use good words. Edifying words. Words that would encourage others. Words that would exalt Jesus Christ. Noble, excellent speech. Seems out of place in the language and vocabulary of a foolish person. Even more unsuitable are lying lips to a prince. You wouldn't expect a prince or a king to use lying lips. Sometimes it does happen, doesn't it? You expect more from those who are in leadership. The world expects more from those of us who are children of God. They have higher standards for us than they do for themselves. Why? Because we name the name of Christ. And therefore, we need to use the words that Christ would use. Then we see verse number eight. A gift is as precious stone in the eyes of him that hath it. Whithersoever it turneth, it prospereth. Now the word for gift is very significant in verse number 8 here. Proverbs 17, verse number 8. Here's the idea of a donation, a bribe, a gift, a present, a reward. Now think about this. A reward, a gift, is a present, present, Stone is precious stone in the eyes of him that hath it. I mean, a precious stone, what is that? A gift of grace. So we could say that when somebody gives another person a gift of grace or a donation or a reward for his or her goodness and friendship, it should always be treasured. Don't take it for granted when somebody does something nice for you. Anyway, you look at that present or that gift, it reminds you of that family member, 
or that friend who loved you enough to give you that particular gift and to give it to you as a way of showing their love for you. And so we see here, the world expects more out of the children of God and we treasure what others do for us. Many people have given me gifts down through the years and I treasure those gifts dearly. I still have many of them in my office. Now, there was a young man. He's with the Lord now. His name was Terry Perkins. And when I came down to our church, it's been about 26 years ago now, almost 27. But when I came down here, he was the very first man that I led to Christ. And we were having vacation Bible school that summer. And I was playing the old timer. I'd been here then about a year. And so I dressed up like an old farmer. And I had a great time with the children that week. I walked out and talked like an older man. And Terry brought me a brand new cowboy hat. Never forgot it. And I treasure that hat. And I'd wear it with my costume. I'd have bib overhauls on and I'd have uh, an old red handkerchief. And I'd put that hat on my head. And when Vacation Bible School concluded, I took it off and gave it back to Terry. And Terry told me, nope. I got that for you. That's a gift from me to you. And I treasure that. I'll see him again one day in heaven. And so it was no doubt a brand name cowboy hat. And it was brand new. Some of you know the value of these types of hats. And uh, to me, it's more than just the value of the hat. It's priceless because it came from a good friend that I had the privilege to lead to Christ. I've had people try to even buy the hat from me. <laughs> I said, no way, Jose. It's a gift by a good friend of mine. I could never part with it. Terry died of a massive heart attack and cancer shortly after this. Every time I walk in the office, I'm reminded of him. And I look forward to seeing him in heaven one day because he put his faith and trust in Christ. And what a great Christian he became. He grew quickly. He really was on fire for the Lord. What a blessing it is just to get a, a little gift from someone. It thrills your heart. Why? Because you know that love is behind the giving of the present. I want to thank all of the people that have been good to me down through the years and helped me in so many different ways. And they are there are many of you and many of my friends. Thank God for good friendship. That's what he's talking about here. It's a blessing. Paul put it like this in Philippians 4.11, not that I speak in respect of want, because I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Paul said, if somebody gives you a gift, thank God for it. But if they don't, thank God for that too. He said here, learn contentment, whether full or empty, cold or hot, rich or poor, because two verses later, he says this, Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Whatever your circumstances are this evening, friends, God is well aware of where you are and what you're going through. He will give you the wisdom. He will give you the strength to make it through this situation. You mark it down. And that's enough to make a Methodist shout. God's looking after his children. Woo, I'm so glad for that. He knows the future. And he holds the future in the palm of his hand. God is a God of miracles. God is a God of deliverance. Back to our verse, Proverbs 17, 8. A gift is like a precious stone in the eyes of him that hath it. Whithersoever it turneth, it prospereth. Now we know that the ultimate gift of all gifts that we could ever receive. The best gift of all is the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We know that the Lord came down and died on our place on that cross, was buried and rose again. And Romans 6.23 said the wages or what we earn 
The wages of our sin is death. Now, there's two deaths described in the Bible. There's the physical death, the first death, and that's when the soul is separated from the body. But then there's the second death, Revelation 21, 8 talks about, which is the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. That's the second death. That is a separation of the soul from God in a terrible place called the lake of fire or hell. And so if you're born once, just physically, you'll die twice. You'll die physically and spiritually. But if you are born twice, born again, not only from your mother, but from Christ, you come to him and ask him to be your savior. You are only going to die once and maybe not even once. Because Jesus could come back today, and if he does, you're going to be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. The Lord is going to descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel and the dead in Christ to rise first. Then we who are alive and remain are caught up together with him to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with him. We'll never die if we are alive when Jesus comes back. The way this old world's getting, friends, it wouldn't surprise me if he didn't come back very soon. Who knows? His, his coming is imminent. That means it could happen at any time. And so always remember that. Salvation is a gift. You can't work for it. You can't earn it. I think so many people get the idea, as long as I'm a good person and do good things, I'll go to heaven. And all of our righteousness is like filthy rags in the sight of a holy God. The very best we could do is not going to get us into heaven. It takes the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, to cleanse us of all sin. And we receive the gift. You don't work for a gift. You receive it by trusting Christ as the one who died for you. Wages, that's what we earn in our life because of our labor and our behavior. You can get a job, you earn your wages. Because we have all sinned in one way or another, our wages is that we're going to die one day if the Lord tears his coming. But don't ever forget that second death is worse than the first death. If you have been saved, You'll never die the second death. You'll never go to the lake of fire. Why? Because you're going to heaven. God saved you when you put your faith in the Lord. He that hath the Son hath eternal life in heaven. So the second death is a separation of the soul of man and the God of the universe. The first death is a separation of the soul from the body. And so we think about these different teachings. The good news, friends, is that Jesus Christ came to this earth to die for our sins, was buried in a borrowed tomb, and he arose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. Praise God for that. And so the wages of sin is death, but listen, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, not through baptism, not through church membership, not through being a good person, not because you were born in America or a Christian nation or a Christian family. Those things are great, but it can only come through Jesus Christ. Again, Romans 6 and verse number 23. So, whatever words that God lays on your heart, you can be assured if he put them there, they're going to be good words. And people are going to be blessed by the words that you use. But if there are wicked words, they didn't come from God. They came from Satan. Shun those words. Shun the hearing of those words. If somebody's using foul language around you, it's best just to walk off. Why? Because you don't want that in your mind. You don't want that in your thoughts. The world is full of trouble anyway. So our focus needs to stay upon God. Our language needs to be pure and clean for God. And when we do that, we will be blessed by the Lord. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. I hope you have a great week. We do have a service at 10 o'clock Sunday morning here at the church. 
and a Sunday school class at 11 o'clock. So come and see us. If you're looking for a church home, we'd love to have you here at Grace Baptist Church. Let us pray. Father, again, thank you for letting us be together. By the means of internet, bless each one who is listening. I pray that God, we would learn these principles, that we would be an encourager to those around us, an exhorter to exhort them and encourage them and motivate others to serve our Savior Jesus. Time is short. We know the night cometh when no man can work, and we want to work while we're able to do so. So give us strength and give us wisdom. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you again, friends, for tuning in. I hope you have a great week. And until the next time, may the Lord richly bless you.